Hello everyone. This is the kind of longer video going over this 1942 model CPD-9-42 uh, Frigidaire that I have here, if you want to get real technical. Uh, what does C stand for? C stands for cold wall, which this is. I'll go into that in a little bit. P stands for porcelain. This all has a porcelain exterior. That's why it's so nice and white after all these years. Uh, also, the D, I think it stands for like the range that it's in. I'm not exactly sure. And 9 stands for 9 cubic feet. This is a big refrigerator for the standards of 1942. I know that 9 cubic feet sounds extremely tiny nowadays, but it's actually quite good for back then. 42? Well, you can guess, 1942. I love how Frigidaire actually put the year in the model number so that no matter if you didn't have any documentation with the fridge at all, you could still tell what year it was made. And some of you in the audience right now are kind of scratching your heads and wondering, wait a minute, 1942? That was right during World War II, the very start of it. Well, of course it was. Whoever got this fridge was extremely lucky to have picked up one of the last to roll off the line. Uh, Frigidaire, along with some other manufacturers, actually did continue to produce some consumer goods not very long into World War II, but for a bit. Eventually, almost everybody started switching over to military production, but yeah, <laughs> whoever got this was probably very happy that they got such a modern, up-to-date refrigerator when they did because everybody else, you know, with their ancient belt drive units that were barely kind of hopping along, they were, they were probably pretty mad that they didn't buy something right before everybody cut off production. So what is a cold wall exactly? It's exactly what it says. The walls are cold. They are actually chilled by a series of evaporator tubes that run through the walls, uh, the side walls, the back wall, even underneath the uh, crisper trays, you know, at the very bottom. Everything has live evaporator coils running through it. Very, very interesting. Here with the door open, you can actually see uh, a full-width freezer, which was actually very rare back then. Uh, I'm not actually sure which manufacturers had that. I'd have to look that up, but that was actually pretty rare. I know GE didn't have this in 1941 or 42 when these came out, and they call it a super freezer. They're, <laughs> they're very proud of this. You know, super freezer. This is not just a freezer, this is a super freezer, whatever definition you give that. But there's actually some, you know, credit to, credit due, you know, where credit's due. It's a very cold freezer. It actually hovers right around zero degrees, which is where modern freezers sit. And this would have been one of the very first freezers that you could have kept food for long periods of time in. So that was a big step forward, actually. Frigidaire was very proud of that. Another benefit to the cold wall system is that the freezer is kind of on its own. It's not really absorbing much heat from the refrigerator cavity because of this uh, insulator divider right here. It's actually like an insulated divider so that normally when, like let's say you were to take this out and it was more like a normal fridge from the era, all of the heat coming from the interior here would rise up to the bottom of the freezing plate and it would condense its frost whenever any moisture would enter the system. So basically, this freezer was able to stay colder because it was kind of separated off from the rest of the refrigerator cavity and you barely ever have to defrost it because all that moisture does not, it's not allowed to 
condense on the freezer plate itself and freeze. So, hence you get less frost. I've actually ran a dehumidifier, sorry, <laughs> humidifier in here, and you can see that it's gotten everything extremely wet, but there's barely any frost in here. I even looked at the underside of this, where you would normally expect to see a huge layer of ice, and there's barely anything. I've had this thing running for a week on top of that. It's pretty good, actually. It was kind of a way for them to advertise that you really didn't have to defrost the freezer. I mean, in, in reality, yes, you would eventually have to defrost it, and they do even have a defroster position on the thermostat, but it wouldn't happen very often. Well, what happens to all that moisture that is now trapped in here and can't freeze on this plate? As you can see, it just kind of collects everywhere. I mean, look at that, you know, just soaking wet. What that means is that you're always going to have high humidity in the refrigerator compartment so that you don't have to cover your foods. Pretty nice, right? Well, that's not the only weird part about this. So, I mean, you, you've got all these benefits and because you've got this insulated partition right here, they had to figure out how in the heck are we going to get all of this heat out of the cabinet now when it's not rising up naturally to the freezer section like it always has in the past. So, like I said before, you've actually got cooling coils in all the walls. And so, another benefit of that is that it actually helps to keep everything more at a more constant temperature. They actually, you know, I think the way they said it was that you don't get seesawing temperatures. So basically it stays, you know, at a constant temperature in the fridge. Your freezer stays at a more constant temperature and colder. And, you know, it's a pretty good design. I really, uh, it'd be interesting to see something like this come back in a modern refrigerator, I think it would be kind of cool to see it implemented. But, yeah, there you go. This uh, partition is actually sloped also, so the water actually will run down it, and then it kind of collects at a little flattened area where when the metal kind of slopes down, and then all of a sudden you've got this area that's just flat at the back. So the moisture kind of forms drops back there and it would drip into a glass tray that's supposed to sit back here, but that got broken a long time ago and I just got little uh, metal pans here to collect all the uh, little drops. Of course, because it's a Frigidaire, you've got a rollout uh, rack, which makes it very easy to get all of your items in the fridge here. I think that there are some other racks that this refrigerator is missing. There should be one up here, and I believe there should also be one down here over this uh, hydrator bed. But they roll out very nicely. This one's missing a piece of glass on top of here. It probably broke at some point. But they roll out very nicely, and they're pretty. Uh, <laughs> you get even more humidity in those than you do in the regular fridge compartment itself. So, pretty interesting design, really. The only other thing that is even more interesting than this, in my opinion, was just what Frigidaire, in general, was using at the time for their compressors. Uh, and the refrigerant that they were using was also kind of unique, let's say. Uh, I, I would call it a good thing. The refrigerant was called R114. It was actually developed by Frigidaire back in the mid-30s, and they were very proud of it. It was actually a chlorofluorocarbon, which, you know, well, that's bad nowadays. Uh, oddly enough, they also created R11 and R12 at the same time. The beloved R12 was actually originally um, kind of... Frigidaire helped out on it, I believe. 
some of you who have much more knowledge than I do will probably be chiming in and saying, you know, who actually, the people that actually developed it and all the companies that worked on it. But I know that Frigidaire was tied to it, as they were R114. Well, what's the difference with R114? It is a much lower pressure refrigerant, even than R12. If you remember from my video on the CA monitor top, I talked about methyl formate, which was actually a very low pressure refrigerant. The high side of the system would actually run in a vacuum during normal operation. Well, this R114 was pretty close. Under normal operation, you could be running about zero PSI on the high side maybe a little bit higher, but we're talking minuscule pressures here. And of course, the low side of the system inside the evaporator, that's going to be, you know, well into vacuum. So kind of an interesting setup. Uh, <laughs> that's actually part of the reason why I was able to fix this fridge after it lost a little bit of its lifeblood, we'll say. I'll go into that later. But going into the actual compressor now, the Frigidaire compressor that they were using at this time and for a very long time was called the Meter Miser. It was a rotary compressor and it was a very interesting design. It only had three moving parts and one of those was the rotor. So we're not <laughs> talking about a complicated mechanism here. It's, the simplest compressor that I've ever heard of. I mean, maybe there's something simpler out there that I haven't heard of. Uh, I think they have like linear compressors now that might be simpler technically, stuff like that. But three moving parts, that's about as simple as you're gonna get. And they were very reliable. I think they came out in 1935 and they carried these all the way up until 1979. That's a long, long run. And chances are, if they wouldn't have been bought up by White Consolidated Industries in 1979, they would have continued using that compressor. So this compressor, as you can see here, actually was a rotary type and extremely simple. It was kind of interesting the fact that it didn't even have an oil pump. It just had a little spiral groove kind of ground into the eccentric shaft, basically, that then oiled by pulling oil up. This groove kind of oiled everything. It worked, you know. These are a little noisy at first whenever they've been sitting for a very long time. If, you, if one of these has been sitting for months, and you turn it on, it's going to sound very radly for the first couple seconds. As long as it goes away after a couple seconds, you're fine. It, it'll quiet out. But, you know, maybe you should turn it off if it sounds like it's about to start hopping across the room. So, just, you know, word of, <laughs> word of caution. But, they're very reliable. They rarely give any trouble. They're were no float valves to worry about in this fridge. There were no check valves to worry about in this fridge. Uh, really, <laughs> technically, no valves in the compressor to speak of, not in the normal sense. The uh, dividing block itself kind of acted as a valve, but it was very, <sighs> what, what, what more can you say? It was just simple. It was built to be as cheap to build, yet as reliable as possible, and use the least amount of energy as possible. When these are running, they only use about 110, 120 watts max. I mean, they're barely drawing any power at all. Now, <laughs> the volt amps and the power factor, that, that's a different matter. They are not efficient as far as the imaginary power that they draw. What's imaginary power? Well, basically, power that you're taking from the power company that isn't doing any real work for you. 
but you're not being charged for it as long as you're only charged for a kilowatt hour. So there you go. <laughs> I, I do think that some people are actually not charged by the kilowatt hour. They're actually charged by the uh, bolt amps that you use. If that's the case, then this wouldn't be efficient for you. But if you're like a normal household being charged by the kilowatt hour, this thing is brutally efficient. In fact, I actually checked it. This would get an Energy Star rating from the U.S. government if it were to come on the market tomorrow. But, you know, the U.S. government could actually give this an Energy Star right there. If this were to come out tomorrow, it's an appliance from 1942, this would get the Energy Star. I compared it against other nine cubic foot models of similar type and it was right there. It was right there with them with energy usage. I'm not going to say it was better, but it's not like the new ones are using a crazy amount less energy. They're not. They're using about the same amount of energy. It's insane. So there you go. <laughs> you get the energy stars slapped on there. You know, a few years late, but that's okay. It, this thing is like new. It's still running great. It doesn't matter. <laughs> There's also a story that goes behind my fridge. As you may have heard me mention earlier, this fridge had to be repaired. One night, as I was running it particularly hard, freezing some desserts in it, I happened to look on the floor right underneath the front of the fridge, and I noticed what you see here in this picture. A little bit of oil in the grout line of my dirty floor Oh no, I thought. Surely that couldn't be coming from a hermetically sealed compressor. Well, I was wrong. It was coming from the compressor. As you can see here, one of the terminals got wet with oil as it leaked out of the sump of the compressor. I immediately shut it off and feared for the worst. I really didn't think that this refrigerator would ever live again. The only thing that gave me a little bit of hope is that the refrigerator was still nice and cold whenever I noticed it. I feared for the worst, though. I feared that not only oil had leaked out, but that its refrigerant had leaked out. R114, refrigerant that you cannot pick up anymore. Fortunately, that was not the end for this refrigerator, though. With the help of some forum posts that I was reading... I was able to find a certain set of terminal seals that were able to seal up these old terminals on this compressor. You see, General Electric had the best terminal seals in the business. They had what are called glass-fused terminal seals, which actually kind of look like a light bulb, where you have a wire that is fused in glass that is then fused in a metal cylinder which is threaded. That metal cylinder is then threaded into and soldered into the base of the compressor. Well, of course, that's going to be a fantastic seal. And sure enough, I don't know of any monitor top that has ever leaked through one of its metal glass seals. However, not all hermetic compressors from this era were using that. Frigidaire was using a very simple type of fiber board sealing mechanism basically where fiber board sealed a little gap in between a nut and a stud coming out and the stud was what was actually hooked up to the power lines outside of the compressor over time this fiber board kind of got dried out and it started leaking oil fortunately I caught it in time and not that much oil leaked out I was afraid that it, with enough oil leaked out, the compressor would never run right again. This isn't the case, however. Once I put the seals on, connected everything back up, everything was fine. Nothing's wrong at all now. The compressor is completely quiet, and no, there's no rattling at all, and I don't see any loss in its uh, cooling ability so it couldn't have lost that much refrigerant. I will say, though, that when I was repairing the terminal that was leaking, I saved it for last because I wanted some practice first. 
it was bubbling out of the oil ever so slightly, just the tiniest little bubbles that you could see. I guess it did leak a little bit of refrigerant out, but it couldn't have been that much. Fortunately, R114 is at such a low pressure that I was able to chill the whole unit out down on my back porch to about 45 degrees. This made the pressure inside the system almost atmosphere, which means that it would be less more much less likely to leak out whenever I'm working on the seals. A good friend from my refrigerator forum, Doug, was able to make up this wonderful little tool for me. He has his own metalworking shop and he does amazing work. Doug, thank you very much for making this tool for me. I wouldn't have been able to get into these little plastic insulators without it. It loosened the nuts perfectly. Once I got it all back together, I fired it up. It did rattle for a bit, but I think that's just because it was cold out on the back porch. But lo and behold, there you see it. Negative 14 degrees in the freezer. I was shocked. I really didn't think this would work again. This fridge was resurrected. It was dead. Any sane person that would have seen this would have thought it was dead. The seals that I bought for it, for God's sakes, they were extremely hard to come by. I actually found them from, from a consignment website. You couldn't just buy them anywhere. Oh, and one last note about my Frigidaire. That little light bulb that you saw that was burning nice and bright... Yeah, that's the original light bulb to this refrigerator. I know, it's hard to believe, but if you look at this picture, you can actually see that it says Mazda on the light bulb. General Electric actually had that trademarked, and they also licensed it out to Westinghouse, who used it up until 1945. They both dropped that name in 1945, so this light bulb was at least made in 1945 I'm going to just assume that this light bulb is actually from 1942 whenever this refrigerator was made I think that's a pretty safe assumption if it's lasted this long already just simply amazing